chapter 6 in Ephesians. This is uh, part 2. We started last week <coughs> preparing for war, and uh, it kind of fits in what's going on in the world today, doesn't it, with the preparing for war. But we're talking about a different kind of war. Uh, Hamas doesn't have any control over this war that we're talking about, although the devil can use it. But we're going to talk about the, the spiritual battles that we face, and we're going to talk about the armor of God a little bit here this morning. So, Last week we talked a little ended up talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And, and the, the point last week, as I talked about back over in Ephesians chapter 4 and then the, and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, was the idea that we need to be ready inside. All right? Uh, it makes no difference what you put on armor on the outside if the inside is not right. And so the idea is we want to be ready inside. So we talked about the life of a Christian being saved and what it meant to, to put off the old man, put on the new man, and we saw all those things in Ephesians 4 as he's talking about us getting ready. Now, we get over here, and Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, and remember, he's in prison right now. He's between the Roman guards, and so he sees these guards. They're with him 24-7, uh, and he's tied to, actually tied to them, and uh, he sees this armor that they have on. So that's where we get kind of this illustration. He uses this to tell us and show us what we need to be ready for and how we need to be ready for the world around us. Uh, so let's look at it a little bit. Let's start off with... Excuse me, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, he's talking to believers there, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we're not going to go very far with that, but the idea is when you're in the right relationship, in the right fellowship with God, and you believe his word, you're trusting his word, then you can have that strength that he has. And remember, we can count on him having all strength. He raised the dead, then he brought Jesus, he resurrected him. And God has demonstrated his strength. And if we, as we walk with him, we can see his strength demonstrated in our life. And he says, be strong in the Lord. We can't do it ourselves. And uh, I, uh, there's, there's times if you've ever uh, been caught up in a situation where uh, somebody was helping you and you tried to pitch in to help them and you didn't really, really more got in the way. And sometimes we get to those situations where we think that, well, God needs our help. Well, God doesn't need our help. We need his help always, and it's in his strength. And that's what he's telling me. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And now we go to verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, notice he says you. He didn't put the word you in there, but it's you put on the armor of God. It's up to you to do that. God doesn't do that for you. So that we can stand against those, those attacks of the devil, the wiles, the different things that he comes at us with. And we don't understand them all, but we know that they're going to come, so we need to be prepared for whatever does come, don't we? And he's going to, he's going to attack, basically, in the, in the three areas that he attacked Christ back in the, uh, Matthew 4. In 1 John chapter 2, verse, I'm going to look at verses 15, 16, and 17. He says, Love not the world, and these are the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so here comes the, the attack for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's the areas that are going to be attacked. Now, you can take any kind of uh, sin you want to come up with. Uh, it'll all fit in there somewhere, maybe in a couple places. And that's what the devil will do to you and I. So we need to be aware of that. So when you, whenever you, you sit there and you're on a, a diet and, and uh, somebody puts a big piece of cake in front of you after you get done eating, you know what that is. They're not the devil. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the, it's the devil tempting you, isn't it? And some of these things that we look at, and, and you know, they seem so uh, meaningless, frivolous, but you'd be surprised how the devil works. And we talked about that, how, how we can get into the mood. You know, a little unforgiveness gets into the picture. See, that's spiritual warfare. Well, you know, you say, and I, we shared that last week. Some people say, well, you don't know what they said to me. Or you don't know how they treated me. So I really, I'm not going to forgive them. I had somebody tell me that here a few months ago. And I thought, wow, you say you're a Christian. And you say you'll never forgive them for that. Well, it, it wasn't a good thing that the person did, but it wasn't the world-shattering thing. It wasn't something else you say, hey, I, I'm pushing away my faith. I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not going like, to act like a Christian anymore. So we need to be careful. The battle is going to come. We know that. We know who's behind it. There's only two forces out there, right? There's God and there's the devil. And the devil uses the world, the flesh, and the pride of life over here. And we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with the Word of God over here. And so then we're caught in the middle. We belong to him, but a lot of times we act like we belong to him. 
how we react to things in life. So when a battle comes, listen, when the battle comes, it's a time for your testimony to shine through because people see how we go through these times. Sometimes he uses false teachers. He'll come into your life, and he'll remember, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, there's a day coming when you're going to want teachers that have the, that'll tickle your ears. They'll make you feel good. And we, we see that today as we look at society, how, how they, well, the Bible isn't really applicable in these modern times. Or things have changed since back in the days of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And things have changed in the world, but God has not changed. See, that's the difference. God, God doesn't adapt his way of life to where we're at. We need to adapt our way of life to where God's at. And so when I think about this armor, and we're going to go over it rather, rather quickly this morning, but he says over in Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children. Now listen, no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. He says, you know what? You need to know the word of God. You need to practice the word of God and you need to live it out. And so you don't be tossed about when somebody comes up and says, I have a new idea. We are another age of philosophy. There are a lot of philosophers out there, a lot of new ideas. Listen, they're not, they're not new. When you study, it's amazing. You ever go back and study some of the old, old idol worship and how the old societies were? And we, we have, what, the new society, and we have the new world order. And when you go back, uh, go back 2,000 years, and you guess what? They were doing the same thing back then, were they? They acted the same way. They did the same way. They put different names on it. But the immorality and the, the, the callousness of society back in that day, we see it today. So that, there's nothing new. Man has not changed. Man, man is where he has always been. He's a sinner condemned in his sin, and he loves to feed the flesh. Go back before you got saved. We look, look over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, ye who were dead in your trespasses and sin, has he made alive? The day that we come alive, then those things of the world, the flesh, and the devil, then we, we change. We started pushing them away. They're no more part of us. And so then, when the, my heart is right, and that's where we get to right here, when the heart is right, and basically we're going to look at this, these different armor pieces, when my heart is right and when I have the right attitude, when I'm focused on the right things, then when the attack comes, I'm prepared for it. And it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. It doesn't mean there's not consequences. But when we stand with God, as we talk about the rapture, there's a day coming when it's all going to be passed anyway. This will all be left behind and we go to glory. So he's talking right here again. He says, now, we're going to be put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. And we know that by, I can stand when I know the word of God, when I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit of God to guide me and to help me through these times. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, so he's using the, the athletic term to, to wrestle. We all know what it means to wrestle. They wrestle around. We see him wrestling on TV and all those kind of things. But it, basically, it means as you uh, two opponents, you grab, you come in, you hit one another, you push on one another, and you try to get one down and get him flat on his back for what is it, the count of three or whatever it is. Well, their their idea of wrestling when they put you down, they would put their their hand on your throat, on your neck, and hold you down so you couldn't get up. And so the the people that are with here in Paul teach this in Ephesus. They, they have a better understanding of what wrestling means than you and I. Remember you see on the TV, the guy jumps up on the rope and he comes down and he smacks the guy on the neck and the guy jumps right back up and hits him. You think, whoa, those guys are tough. In those days, in those times, a wrestling match, you know what happened to the loser? He got his eyes gouged out. He would never see again. If he lost the wrestling match, they gouged, gouged his eyes out. So do you think that there would be anything left on the table when there was a wrestling match going on? You would be using everything in your power to be the victor, wouldn't you? Because nobody wants to go through life blind. They didn't kill them. They just gouged their eyes out. So they understand what Paul's talking about. And you know the consequences of losing the match in life with the devil can cause a lot of pain and suffering in our lives, can't it? See, you don't lose your salvation. We understand that. Once saved, always saved. So we're, we're secure in God's hands. But when we go through these trials and these testing, and when we stumble, and when we fall, and when we backslide, quote, unquote, we can lose our joy. We can lose our peace. We can lose our testimony. You know, there's, those are consequences that you don't want to have to live with as a Christian. 
So Paul's talking to him. He said, now, here's, here's what you've got to do now. You see what the, where the battle is at? And I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm going to tell you what. It's a spiritual battle. There's physical aspects to it. God, uh, the devil will use physical things in our body, but it's a spiritual battle. And that's why we don't recognize it so easily. You ever just have a period, and nothing seems to go right, and you just get irritated, and you just, what, what is, why is all this happening to me? You ever stop and think, oh, wait a minute. I know why it's happened to me. Either I have sin in my life, and I need to look at that and repent, or maybe God is allowing the devil, as in Job's case, to attack me. Why would God allow the devil to attack you? Did you ever ask that? Well, I, I'm his child. You know, as a loving father, I would never allow somebody just to attack my child if I could avoid it. But God knows more than we do, doesn't he? And the Bible tells us his ways are higher than our ways. And so what he can use you and I as in our testimony as the devil attacks us through these different areas of our life, when we stand firm, when we stand fast, when we're unmoved, and people can look at us and say, you know what, how did they do that? I've heard people say that about some of you. How did they do that? They don't do it in their strength. They do it in the strength of the Lord because they have faith and trust that God is in control and God's going to work it all out in the end. Amen. And see, that's how we live through this life. I walk by faith and not by sight. And those words can flow so easily. But you know what that means? I believe and I trust without a doubt, a shadow of doubt in my mind and in my heart that God is in control and he's going to take care of this and he's going to get me out of this world and get me to glory someday. And I know that I can trust him. I believe that with all my heart. So when the, when the challenge comes, when the devil is attacking me, and I start, I start wondering what, what, why, I say, no, don't think that way. Go through the scripture, allow the Holy Spirit to work, and I stand firm. Well, why are you going through that? I don't know. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But I don't know why, but I know God's in control, and I know God has a plan. And I know he has a destiny for me. And that, that's the most important thing. You know, many times we ask people, are you 100% sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Now, that's a pretty simple question, isn't it? Do you ever stop and think about that? We talk about the, the rapture, right? The, the rapture is an evidence of salvation, right? If, if rapture happens on a Sunday morning, and I'm up here preaching, and all of a sudden I'm gone, right? I'm gone, you're going to wonder, what happened to him? You better not wonder that, because you should be going with me, Right? Nobody wants to be left behind, but are you willing to do what it takes not to be left behind? You know, we talk about living the kind of life prepared for Christ's coming, and we do. We want to have the right testimony, and we want to be doing the right thing. But the only way to really be prepared is through faith in Christ and Jesus Christ, faith in, in Christ and Christ alone. But when I'm born again, born in his family, I know that I know that I know. So no matter what happens here, we're together forever. So that's pre preparation, okay? That's being prepared for the rapture. So let's go a little bit further. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. We've got to take the whole thing. You can't leave part of it off. And, he, and, and maybe that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Evil day. When is the evil day? Now, how would I know when the evil day is? I can tell you when the evil day is. Uh, yesterday was an evil day. Today is an evil day. And tomorrow will be an evil day. Because guess what? There'll be no day that you're going to live upon this earth that there won't be a temptation, a trial coming in your life. It might be major and it might be minor. It may be noticeable and it might not be noticeable. But to every day in the life of a Christian is an evil day considering the world that we live in. But we have the victory, right? Right? We do have the victory, right? There, we're, we're, not, we're not the loser in this. Even if I stumble, even if I fall short of living up to what God really wanted me to do for him, to bring honor and glory to his son, I, I still am secure in the family of God. And I have a father who will forgive me and allow me to, to get back off the ground, get, pick myself back up, and let him work in me and through me that I can be restored. Not to salvation, to fellowship. So he says here, I'm going to be able to stand in that evil day and done all to stand. That means I'm doing everything that I can do on my part. I, I study the scripture. I know the scripture. I know who God is. I know where he comes from. I know what he wants. And so then I allow his strength and his spirit and his word to work through me. Make sense? Think, think you can do it on your own? No, you can't, can you? It's like getting sick. We talk about being sick. 
You go to the doctor. Why do you go to the doctor? Because you can't take care of it yourself. Most of us don't go until we, I mean, it's really down to the nitty-gritty. I mean, you, you got to go, right? Can't, you can't get past it. You know, the problem, sometimes the problem with living a lot of years, okay, through the lifetime, you have things, you get sick, but you get better. And you didn't do anything about it. You just got better. And so you think, well, next time I'm sick, I'll get better. I did before, and you do. And pretty soon, that's why they say that the, the worst patient is one that's never been sick. Because you can't, I, I can't handle it. I can't, there's, I can't get past this. And so when we see that we are sin sick and we have to get on this whole armor now, I'm going to stand there and I'm going to have my loins go about with truth. I'm going to have this, they call it like this big belt. And what they did back in that day and time, they would tuck in their, their uh, outer garments so they could fight, so they wouldn't get in the way, their shirt or their jacket, whatever we would call today. So they, they put the truth. What is truth? What is truth? They, today, today they said there is no absolute truth. There is absolutely no absolute truth. That makes sense, doesn't it? Huh? But there is an absolute truth. And you've got a couple of things I've just marked down here. One of the absolute truths is what? The person of Christ. Right? The person of Christ. We see, let me get my page turned over here a little bit. We've got uh, John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh from the Father but by me. So Jesus Christ is the truth. I go over to John 17, 17. Christ in his great priestly prayer, he said this. He said, sanctify them, set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then he tells us to be truthful in the way we deal with one another. Ephesians 4, 25. Wherefore, put away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So for truth, we know God is truth. So everything about God is truth. He, the, his power, who he is, that's all truth. His son is truth. His word is truth. And so how, how do I know that? Okay? How, how can I know that that's truth? Well, what, do you, what is one thing about, if you want to look at the word truth, what, what's one of the characteristics that really identify what truth is? Hmm? There's nothing else. There's no, there's no other opinion. If this is truth, then there can't be another opinion. You can have opinions, but it won't match up. It doesn't deny what truth really is because there's only one truth. The truth is there's only one way to heaven, right? That's through Jesus Christ. So when somebody comes up to me and says, well, wait a minute. Well, well you, gotta, you put faith in Christ plus you get baptized, then you get to go to heaven. That's not truth. If, if you just be good enough, okay, if you get saved, and if you just be good enough, if, you, if you're sinless, some people believe in that sinlessness, they, that's a lie right there, but the idea is that you believe all these things, and it's, that's not the truth. Christ said, I am the truth. And uh, so when we get people that take the Bible, okay, and they say, well, there's contradictions in the Bible. The Bible has got errors in it. No, it doesn't. When we talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, I'm talking about the day back when they all sat down and they wrote it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about all the translations that are out there. Hmm? No, I'm talking about when it was originally given uh, through the Holy Spirit to the different writers of the Bible. That is truth, and that truth never changes. So we can count on that, can't we? There's no, when somebody says there's something wrong in the Bible, there's a contradiction, that's a lie. That's a lie. That he said something, that's a lie. There's the truth of Scripture, and you, you must believe that. If you, if you think there's an error in the Bible, point it out to me. Well, you said, I've heard people say, well, you look right here. Here's this account in the Gospels where they, he said there was three people there, and over here he said there's only two people there. It's not a contradiction. It's an account of the same event given from two different perspectives. That's all. So when you want to talk about the inerrancy of the Bible, or the Bible being it with fault, then what you've got to do is say what parts are true and what parts are not true. And what you think might be true, you'll think is false, and what you think is false, I might think is true, and guess what? Huh? It gets right back to what man thinks, doesn't it? And man has no way of understanding God, so we stick with the truth of the Word of God and what he's told me I need to do. So that is truth. So I have this, this belt of, of truth, and then have on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, as a Christian, we understand righteousness. We get righteousness when we get saved, don't we? Over in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Talk, talk about that word. He takes our sin, put it on Christ at the cross, and he puts his righteousness on us. 
So we have this righteousness. Well, the breastplate, what does the breastplate really do? It protects the, this area here. It's actually supposed to go from here down to the thighs. Okay? So it protects the heart. Well, in Scripture, as we study Scripture, the heart is what is this. That's who we are. We have thoughts up here and everything. Up there, but this is who we are. Okay? This is, where we, this is where we make our profession of faith. And this is where we put our faith and trust in Christ from down here. And so I, I want to protect my heart. What do I mean to protect my heart? Okay, I, I know righteousness. And so if, I, if the devil is coming at me, then I need the, the righteousness to stand there and protect my heart so I don't change, so I don't start questioning. I need to have this protection of righteousness, right living according to the word of God, and then the things that I believe in and what I am, I can stand firm on. Because guess what? We have a tendency sometimes to start wavering. You ever think of that? You know, I've seen people that I really thought, you know, if, if that person, when it comes to spirituality, that person has got it right. I mean, they, they are living, they think, and everything I know about them is just right down the line. And then after a while, they'll say something or do something. Wow, I didn't realize they, they had that idea. Or that. And it's not that they were way off. It's just that you kind of put them up on a, a pedestal like, you know, they're a little more spiritual than I am. They know a lot more. It's not necessarily true. So we have to be careful. But I want to protect my heart. So I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness, and then I'm going to have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay? So I had the righteousness. I was going to, oh, I was going to cover a verse with you, wasn't I? Romans 3, 21, 22. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested or revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by, listen, by faith of Jesus Christ unto all upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. We see right there the, the righteousness, and it's based upon the faith of Jesus Christ. And then I get on down here to the, the feet shod with the gospel. And when I know the gospel, okay, that's, that's what we stand on, isn't it? We stand on the word of God, and the word of God is the good news, the gospel, that man is a sinner condemned in his sin, and God, in, an, in a, a moment of mercy and grace, reaches out to man and touches him, and he says, you believe my son has died for your sin. You don't have to face my wrath. You can be saved, delivered from the wrath of God by putting your faith and trust in my son. And you can stand on that. You know, of all the messages we have, we you know, preach and teach a lot of different messages, but, but the greatest message of all of them is the gospel. Without the gospel, the rest of this is a waste. If you don't have the gospel, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, none of this means anything to you. There is no armor for you to put on. There is no protection from the attacks of the devil. There's nothing for you apart from faith in Christ and Christ alone, and you, then you have the privilege to put on the armor of God because you have a, these things available to you. But you have to do it. So many times in life, people look for somebody else to do something for them. Wait, will you do this for me? Will you, what, can't you do it? Yeah, I can do it, but I want you to do it for No, no, no. Hey, let's, let's stand on our own two feet, and let's put on the armor of God. Let's stand firm in what we believe and understand, and don't let other people get in the way. Let's, let's stay true to the gospel. Let's stay true to what God's called us to be. And I know I'm going through this pretty quick. We could make a message out of each one of these pieces. But, and you're a little bit further. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Well, we know back in that day and time, they, they did. They shot those arrows up in the air, you know, and they'd shoot them up and they'd come down. They'd be flaming arrows. They'd have pitch on them where they'd continue to burn. And they, the guys would put their shield up there like that and they would come down the stick and they would burn. And so you needed to catch those arrows. You didn't want them to get through and get to you. And he says the devil's going to use all kinds of arrows. He might use big arrows, little arrows, long arrows, short arrows. He says they're taking the shield of faith with the faith. Faith in what? Well, first of all, we look at faith, what, for salvation. Do I truly believe that Christ died for my sins? Am I putting my faith and trust in that shed blood as payment for my sin? Okay, that's my salvation. You see, that, that's, that's when I got saved. That's when I've been born again. I've, I've been adopted into the family of God. But then from that day on, it comes that time I have to walk. And I'm called to walk in, by faith according to the word of God. And if, if I can't, if I don't believe what God is telling me, I'm going to waver. I'm going to question. I'm going to say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, this ain't going the way it's supposed to go. This ain't the way it should be. So we're going to waver. And he says, right here, I'm going to put on that, that, have that shield of faith. 
and I'm not going to let my faith be wavered. I know that I know that I know I'm a child of God. I know that I know that I know that God is in control, and I know that I know that I know God's word is true, and God will keep his word. So I can trust him. I can believe him. And so when the arrows come, I just need to keep in my mind. And listen, it's the idea of staying focused in the midst of the battle. It's not easy. When you're in pain, when somebody has said something or done something to, to really hurt you, when something's happened in your life, think of those people over in, in Israel right now. When they see their children and their wives and their husbands being dragged through the streets dead by these terrorists. You go down to the, the third world countries where they're, they become Christians and then the, the Muslims and the terrorists come in and, and uh, the one lady we got here, a picture over here, uh, they come in and she was there with her husband and they walked in and chopped his head off. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're sitting in your home. You're not doing anything really to hurt anybody. You're just kind of minding your own business. And a group of men come in and walk up to your husband and take a uh, knife and cut his head off. How do you deal with that? We read about where they come in and they kill their kids. Usually they let the woman and the girls live. The boys and the men, the men are gone right away. How do, how do you deal with that if you don't know who you are? If you don't believe with all your heart that God's in control? See, you, that's, a, that's a time where they, you know, the old saying, the rubber meets the road. How do you react? And they react in different ways. Some get angry, some get hurt, some get vindictive. But you ever, you ever notice as you read the stories, they come around. They start forgiving. They start doing what they should as a Christian. Yeah, your initial response may not be the greatest response for a Christian. But when you stop and think about it, when you start praying about it, you allow God to work in it and through it, you see how they come around and they keep the faith, they keep the trust, they understand that God's in control. So I got that shield, and then the last thing I'm going to take a look at, well, we got, the, we got the helmet of salvation. Of course, that protects what? The brain, right? That helps me to think, helps me to understand. And also, the helmet protects my brain, because you know what? Would you believe that a Christian can doubt whether they're saved or not? You would be surprised how many people come and say, how can I know that I'm really saved? How, how, what proof can I have that I'm really saved? And we can go to Scripture. But you know what happens, Adam? You, you, have to take, you can take the scripture. It's, it's like going to the doctor, okay? You go to the doctor, and you say, here's my symptoms, doctor. And he says, here's the here's prescription for you. This will take care of you. So what do you got to do? You say, well, <laughs> that guy, he did not know what he's talking about. I ain't taking that medicine. So what happens? Sometimes we understand the, the fleshly old body. Sometimes it'll get better. Overall, just stop and think about it. If I, he says, here's what you need to do, and I say, no, I'm not going to do that because I don't trust you. So nothing changes. And so what I'm doing, I'm, I have to demonstrate a trust, a faith in, in that doctor to take that medicine to do what he said it would do. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it's up here. It's up here. That's what we're protecting. I know who I am. I know who he is, but doubts can come into your mind. People can put doubts in your mind. Christ, is, no, he, he really wasn't the Savior. Be surprised how easy some Christians are moved. Why, are, why does that happen? Because they haven't been discipled and they don't read the Word of God. So we're going to protect their brain with the helmet so that we don't get the wrong ideas when we get caught up. And then a sword of the Spirit, which is the uh, Word of God. Listen, Christian. I guarantee, I'm going to guarantee you something. You can't spend too much time in this word. You can't spend too much time learning and reading. Because many times, and we shared this before, many times the Bible, in the Bible, these things were written as an example, as an example. So, you know what? I can look and say, well, wait a minute. God did that here. I can trust him to do the same here because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I get into the Word of God and I study the Word of God, not proves it, but I study it and I meditate on it, uh, I have an, a, a weapon that the devil can't destroy. And you know what? I don't have to have this with me all the time because I have it up here and I have it down here. So you need to have the Word and you need to know the Word and you need to trust the Word. And the Bible tells us, we're going to close with this, the Bible tells us that one thing, what? Salvation 
is of Christ and Christ alone. Okay? The Bible tells me this, that salvation is by Christ and Christ alone. There's none other name under heaven, given under heaven, where man must be saved, right? So why does the devil get so mad? Why are even the Jewish people in Israel fighting against Christians? Because of Jesus Christ. He is the answer. He is the answer to all of the world's problems. People, when, when Christians come into the picture and when Christians are living out their faith, they make a difference. And that's our challenge for you and I. I don't know what's going to happen over the Middle East. We talk about the, the rapture. We talk about the tribulation. We talk about all those things. And, and there's great things to talk about and think about. But I want to tell you what. The most important thing is, if you're saved and you know Christ as your Savior, what happens over there doesn't make any difference. You must, you must know that you know that you know. You must have that confidence today. If I was to breathe my last breath, and we know there's people, I uh, shared the story the other day with a lady who's going to the, the uh, beauty shop. She never made it. I don't have any idea who it was, so I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. But she never made it. Why? She had a car accident, and she was killed. She wasn't planning on dying that day. She didn't get up that morning and say, you know what, I'm going to go down there, and before I get down there, I'm going to die. No, she wasn't. And I, I just pray that she was ready to die. His made a friend, made a good friend up here on the mountain. His dad walked out, backed over his house, walked out in the yard, dropped over dead. You don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so we have something better waiting for us up there. And it's not, I read the other day in Randy Alcorn's book, I think people have the idea that you're going to be sitting up here playing a, a, a harp. I can't even play a spoon, let alone a harp. You know, so what would I be? No, God's got, he, listen, if you think this world is good and we have some great times down here, that pales compared to what's up in heaven. There is something so great waiting for us in heaven. But, but it is so simple. There's this, this, there's this door that you've got to go through. Hmm? What is the door that you have to go through? He says, I am the door. I am the gate. I am the great shepherd. It's, listen, it's Christ and Christ alone. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what they tell you about another way. Or any, it, it, it's so sad that it is so simple, and people want to find something else. If I could just do something, you can. You can reject Christ and go to hell and live there forever. Or you can receive Christ and go to heaven and live there forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day and for this time. We pray you would be with each one of us. Let each one of us look at our own heart, Lord, and, and, just, and, and judge in our own heart. Are we 100% sure that if you was to die today, you'd go to heaven? I'm basing my, my confidence on you, Lord, on what you've told me. You've told me and you promised me by putting my faith and trust in the shed blood of your son as payment for my sin. I have eternal life. And Paul writes that to be absent from this body is to be in your presence. And I read all those promises in your word, and I believe your word. So, Lord, I pray if there be one here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they've never entered into a personal relationship with you. I pray this would be the day, that this would be the hour, that they would repent, that they would turn from this world and turn to you and put their faith and trust in the shed blood of your son as payment for their sin. Believing with all their heart that price was sufficient. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for what you've done for us. We pray as we leave this place today that each of us will have the kind of life that would bring honor and glory to you and lift up the name of your son and we'll praise you for all you're going to do.